If you've got a Bible there, oh, I've already got my glasses. You know why I did that? I opened that up to get my glasses out, but I've already got my glasses on. Um, but I couldn't see I had my glasses on without my glasses on. So, And I wasn't looking at myself, so I wouldn't have seen it anyway without them on. But I've got them on, so if I was looking at myself, I would have seen it, but I wasn't looking at myself. Okay, turn with me to the book of Mark chapter 8, if you've got a Bible there, Mark chapter 8. That's <laughs> what happens when you have a couple of weeks in bed. and uh, 16 days, I was in bed for 16 days, barely got out. Mark chapter 8. We'll be talking about <coughs> uh, discipleship um, for a few weeks now. We've been talking about those statements that Jesus made that we wish Jesus never said. Um, and we've, we've covered a little bit in terms of the rich young ruler and Jesus making that, that awful statement to him, sell everything, give to the poor and come follow me. And it's not actually an awful statement. It was a liberating and a freeing opportunity that he was extending to this rich man. Of course, we know the story. The rich man turned around and said, no, I don't want to accept that invitation to a better life. And so he didn't do what Jesus said. But did Jesus tell everybody to sell everything they have and give it to the poor? No, no, he didn't. Exactly right. He said it to this particular man. Why? Because he asked. Exactly right. This man approached Jesus, asked a question. Jesus answered him. This was not Jesus going, let's find a rich man so that I can set up a principle for everybody that has a dollar in their bank account to make sure that if they really love me, they'll get rid of it and they'll live in absolute poverty. That's not what he was saying. So we've covered a little bit of that. I want to move on now to another statement in Mark chapter 8 and verse 34. To me, this is the most pivotal statement that Jesus ever made on the issue of discipleship. And I'm going to take the next probably three, four weeks, and we're going to kind of unpack. There's a break in the middle of that in two weeks' time. We've got a special guest preacher. I won't let the cat out of the bag yet, but I'm looking forward to that. Um, but, but over the next three, four times I'm up here, I want to dance around this statement because there's so much in here, and there's a lot of stuff in here that I think can be misinterpreted, can be taken to extremes. So I don't want to just rush over it. The statement that Jesus made is this, Mark 8, 34. It says, when he had called the people to himself, with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. You find the same uh, statement recorded by Matthew in Matthew 16, 24, but he says, if anyone desires to come after me. Luke 9.23, Luke records the same thing, if anyone. Now, when Jesus said to the rich young ruler, sell everything, give it to the poor, he was speaking to a particular person. So I'm not saying that Jesus won't speak to you and say, sell everything you've got and give it away. I'm not saying he won't do that, but I'm certainly not saying he's telling you to do that. That's where you need to learn to develop your spiritual ears and listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying to you and open your spiritual eyes and see the way that he's leading you personally and individually. But the reason I don't like this statement is because he doesn't give me an out because he uses the word whoever. Now, anytime Jesus says whoever, he's speaking to you and me. He's talking about anybody. He's saying, I don't care what your background is. I don't care what your age is. I don't care what your socioeconomic position is. Uh, I don't care about your nationality. What I'm about to say now is something that is applicable for all people. What I'm about to say now is something that anybody, anybody who wants to follow me has to have a look at and a think about and wrestle with because there are implications in this statement for you and for me. So Jesus says, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. It's the most significant statement. And I think it's the statement that on the back of everything else Jesus talks about discipleship basically bounces off this one statement. So as I said, I want to spend a few weeks going over it. Now, Jesus is talking here to people that are referred to as disciples. Okay, He's talking to people that, that assumedly are following, want to follow, have a heart to follow. This statement is not for Klingons. Anyone know what a Klingon is? Remember many, I'll do an age thing here. Who remembers the song Star Trekking? Who remembers that when they were Star Trekking across the universe? Remember that one? On the Starship Enterprise under Captain Kirk. Yeah? <laughs> Obviously no one remembers that as good as me because you didn't sing along. <laughs> and there's a line in the song. There's Klingons on the starboard bow, starboard bow, starboard bow. Klingons on, yeah, 
Exactly. Klingons on the starboard bow. Now these Klingons, the Klingons were the arch enemy of the Star Trek. Now who's a, who's a Trekkie here? Who's a Star Trek person? Good, because I'm not either. <laughs> I'm not either. I just remember the song when I was putting this, 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 this uh, together. And this particular line, it goes, there's Klingons on the starboard bow. So they're flying through this ship and these Klingons are hanging on the ship. Now, the thing is with a Klingon, a Klingon is not putting any effort or energy into going forward. The Klingon's not even moving. You know what's happening to the Klingon? The Klingon is simply being dragged along by the momentum of the ship. The Klingon's not doing anything to get from A to B. The Klingon is simply riding on the back of the spaceship's momentum. And how many of you know that there are people this morning sitting in gatherings who are just like Klingons? Now, there's nothing wrong with Klingons. I'm not saying if you're a Klingon, you shouldn't be here. But what I'm saying is this. Klingons are those people that just ride on the spiritual momentum of maybe a gathering. More people and, and, and look, let's face it. Who doesn't like coming to a, a, a gathering of nice people? Because we're Christians. We're nice people. We're nice. You hang around me. I am so nice. But I would not melt in my mouth. Ask my wife. Actually, don't ask my wife. Ask Daniel. I'm so nice. I'm a really nice guy. And we're all nice because that's what happens. We come to Jesus, and when we come to Christ and we start following him, boy, do we become nice. <laughs> oh, well, we are just nice. Or at least we're nice for an hour on a Sunday morning. <laughs> so nice to be here. I'm going to shake your head. Oh, I can't shake hands. Sorry, we all by bump in this place. We're going to elbow bump and we're going to smile at each other and we're going to be so nice to each other because we're nice. That's what Jesus does. He makes you nice. So who doesn't want to be in a nice environment? So it's great to come along and, and, and if you're a person here and, and I'm describing you, now you know that you don't take any responsibility or do anything in terms of your own spiritual growth or progression to get to where God wants you to be or to be the person. You're not doing anything. You're just a Klingon. And let me just say this to you. It's okay if you're a Klingon. I'm not, I'm not having a go at Klingons. But what I'm saying is this. At some point, you have to make a choice to not be a Klingon. At some point, you've got to make a personal choice to go, I don't want to, I'm not prepared to just be carried along by the momentum of everybody else. I've got to get some of my own momentum up. Amen? I've got to start taking this journey with Jesus, this relationship with the invisible God, I've got to start taking this thing a little bit serious. I've got to allow that relationship to mean something to me, not just for an hour and a half on a Sunday morning. It's got to mean something to me when I get out of bed on Monday and go to work. It's got to mean something to me when I have to deal with my kids because they're doing something stupid. Not that that happens in my house. It's got to mean something to me when my wife is not logical enough to see that what I'm saying is right. Not that that happens in my house. It's got to mean something 24-7 to us. The, the faith that we have, this relationship with God, becomes something that engages in all areas of life. And we're all on a journey. And, and some of us, we're very engaged here. We're not so engaged over there. It's okay. This is not a beat down. It's not a condemning thing. But there comes a point where, where we realise that this spiritual journey, this relationship that we have is so important and it's so all-consuming that, that, that we allow it to shape all of our life, not just an hour and a half on a Sunday. I'm not just nice here because I'm nice and then I go away and I'm tearing each other up. I can't believe that person wore that to church today. Can you believe that? Can you believe the shirt Daniel had on this morning? I don't know. Was he laying carpet and fell over and got stuck to it? I don't know what was going on with Daniel and his shirt this morning. I just don't have a clue. <coughs> yeah. And what's... Yeah, that's right, but your hair looks great. <laughs> I don't just come here on a Sunday and, and pray and push into God, but then for the rest of the week, every time I have a problem or an issue, I just get angry, frustrated turn to the latest self-help book or and then I actually pray during the week and I bring those issues to God and I talk to him about that stuff. You know what's interesting and I was just thinking about this and I digress a little but here's the thing. What is the time when most people press into God the most? It's when we're down in a valley, isn't it? When we're in a valley and we have no other option and nothing else works, 
we, we get on our knees and we find this thing inside of us to press in to God, to pray, to, to, to maybe open up the Bible and even just randomly say, God, I don't, even, I don't even read this thing anymore, but just speak to me. Anyone ever done that? Just speak to me. And we pick it up, we blow the dust and we just start reading and God is faithful and he'll, he'll, he'll speak to us and he'll meet us in that place. <laughs> But when we're down in the valley, we press in really serious. We get serious about our spiritual walk with God, about our life with God. What happens when he picks us up and we end up on a mountaintop? It's funny. The mountaintop places are generally where most people get the laziest with their spiritual pressure and they're pushing into God. When things are going really well, that's when we get the laziest. I don't, all my bills are paid, the bank balance is looking good, the kids are treating me with respect, Jackie's doing absolutely everything I say, not questioning anything. It must be God, it's a miracle, I'm living the dream. My body's healthy, the Tigers have won at least a game. Please, Jesus, just one more. One more. Amen. And and, and the funny, when we're in those places, we generally tend to back up a little bit from God. We don't press in. What would the church look like? What could your life look like? What could a rise look like if we were a group of people that when we were at the top of the mountain, We pressed into God as passionately as what we do when we know we're at the bottom of the valley. It's no wonder many people go like this. I want to lift the weights and do all the stuff when I'm in the bottom of the valley, but when I get to the top of the mountain, don't feel bad if that's you. That's what Israel did. Go and read the Old Testament. That's exactly 100% the story of the nation of Israel. As soon as God came through and they got what they wanted, they turned and they started intermarrying with other wives of other religions and then they started worshipping their gods and then they turned their back on God and then all of a sudden calamity would come upon them and they'd be oppressed and taken over by a nation. They'd cry out to God on their knees in the valley and God would answer them and he'd come and break into the world as a gracious loving father does and he'd pick them back up to the top of the mountain and when they got to the top of the mountain what did they do they forget God again they stopped pressing in I wonder what it would have been like for them had they had that same uh, passion to press into God at the top of the mountain as they did at the bottom of the valley see I think this is a key for people in their walk with God I think we grow a really strong uh, relationship with God if we can learn. If you take nothing else out of today, just take that one thing. If you can think about how passionate and desperate you get for God at the bottom of the valley, and if you can maintain those disciplines and that same attitude at the top of a mountain, man, you, you will soar in your relationship with God. You really will. Because that's what God wants. I don't think God wants us kind of teetering on this edge of a, <coughs> a precipice. One day feeling like he loves you, one day feeling like he doesn't, one day... I think God wants us to press beyond into a place where we're confident and secure. A place where the Holy Spirit witnesses with our spirit that you're a child of God. We're not constantly second guessing. I think God wants us to go to that, <coughs> to that place. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus basically gives us a roadmap. A roadmap to discipleship. And as I said, I'm going to spend a few weeks going over this. But let me just break it down real quickly. There are four basic things that he has to say, and they're not rocket science. Number one, he says, whoever desires to come after me. That's, that's step number one. And I believe, too, that this is sequential. I believe there's a sequence to what Jesus is saying. It's not just, he's just not randomly saying things as they pop into his head. Anyone do that? Anyone know people that just say things as they pop into their head? Hey? I love lamp. Chewing gum on shoes. Uh, just randomly popped into my head just then. Everybody say what pops into your head right now. Just say it. <laughs> Jenny saw laughter in her head. That's <coughs> Step one, he says, whoever desires to come after me. Num- point number two, he says, let him deny himself. We're going to talk about these in the weeks to come. Number three, he says, take up his cross. And number four is the end result. Number four is the end result. Number four is this, follow me. Follow me is the end result of step one, two, three. As a matter of fact, if you don't look seriously at step one, two, and three, and if you don't look at them, break them down, and go, how does that apply to my life? The end goal of following, it won't ever happen. You'll never really follow him unless we deal with the first three. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. And as I said, I want to spend some time over the next few weeks on that, but all I want to do today is say this, the end game of Jesus has always been to get you to follow him. It's always been the end game is to get you to follow him. Jesus wants you to follow him. He doesn't want you to become religious. He doesn't want you to obey a set of rules. He doesn't want you to to, uh, memorize every book of the Bible just for the sake of it. 
He doesn't want you to turn up to meetings and attend meetings. The end game of this is he wants you to follow him. Now, Jesus made this very, very clear when he was on planet Earth. I'm just going to give you a few statements out of the book of Matthew. Matthew 4.19, then he said to them, he's speaking to Simon, Peter and Andrew. Then he said to them, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. He didn't say study me. He didn't say try to understand me and try to work me out. He said this, I want you to what? I want you to follow me. In other words, get up, watch where I'm going and be with me. Don't overcomplicate it, Simon. Don't overcomplicate it. Just get up. And when I go, go. And when I speak, respond. And when I ask, do. It's not overly complicated. I want you to get up and follow me. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 22. But Jesus said to him, this is a man who came and said, I'll follow you, but let me bury my father first. And Jesus said, hey, let the dead bury their own dead. By the way, he wasn't being... uh, he wasn't being um, overly ruthless here. The way it worked in Jewish times is generally most people had two burials. There was a burial of the body and then as the body would decompose, they would dig it back up. They would then get the bones and they would take the bones to the family sepulchre or tomb. They didn't have individual grave sites ever. They had, uh, the families had a tomb. And so all the bones of all the family would end up in that tomb. But of course, it's not a huge tomb, so you can't fit everybody's body in there. So they would often bury the bodies as they decompose. They would, so, so I think Jesus here is talking about, this man's talking about that second burial. I need to go and dig up. So don't think that Jesus is just being heartless and going, I don't care. Mind you, he is stating the fact that he needs to be more important to us than anything else in life if we want the life that he has for us. But again... What did Jesus say? He said, follow me. I want you to follow me. The game is I want you to follow me. Matthew 9, 9. And Jesus passed on from there. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So Matthew said, no, 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 you follow me and we'll make a mint. Jesus said, Matthew, I want you to follow me. What was the end game? Follow me. Matthew 10, 38. And he who does not take up his cross and what? Follow after me. He's not worthy of me. Matthew 19, 21, Jesus said to him, this is the rich young ruler. If you want to be perfect, go, sell what you have, give to the poor, you'll have treasure in heaven. And then what? Come and what? The end game was what? Follow me. The end game has always been about following him, not knowing stuff about him. It's always been following him. It's always been be in relationship with me, see what I'm doing, hear what I'm saying and do it. Come with me. I'm not sending you out by yourself. I'm with you. But let's do this thing. John 10, 27, Jesus made this statement. He said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they what? They follow me. When you go back through the Gospels and you look at Jesus' uh, words and how he spoke about those, the disciples, it was so much followership language that he uses so many times. Everything in Matthew is repeated in Mark and Luke. So I'm not going to go through all the scriptures again, but the same statements are repeated. They're recorded by Mark. They're recorded by Luke. John 12, 26, if anyone serves me, let him what? Follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be. Why is he going to be there? Because he's following me. John 21, 22. There's a disciple there thinking, well, Jesus just told uh, Peter, I think it was, that he was, he was going to end up dying for his faith. And so he turns around and says to Jesus, what about John? And Jesus makes it very clear. He says, what I do with him, the way he follows me is the way he follows me. You just focus on following me. You just follow me. The end game has always been about following Jesus, God wants us to follow him in relationship. God wants us to have an active relationship with him, not just a bunch of head knowledge about scriptures and Greek and Hebrew and all that sort of stuff. He wants us to have a living relationship with him. That is the end game. In John 10.10, Jesus said this. He said, the thief comes to steal, kill and destroy, but I've come to give you life. So the end game is this. Jesus wants to give you life. Make no mistake about it. He wants to give you life. If you backtrack to that story too, by the way, you'll see that the thief he's referring to was actually religion and and the religious leaders. I know we refer to it as the devil, but the story begins at the beginning of John chapter 9. Go and read it yourself at some point. And it goes right through. Blind man, uh, guy born blind, gets given his sight back. All of a sudden he can see he's pumped and excited. The religious leaders sit him down, shine a light in his eyes, like on the spy movies. Who healed you? He said, look, I don't know. I I couldn't see him. Understandably. Anyway, he says, look, this guy healed me. 
They're having a go at him. You know why? Because he did it on the wrong day of the week. So they're having a go. Jesus basically, the guy gets excommunicated from the church. Jesus, it says, when he heard about that, he went and found him. And he begins his conversation with him. And in the course of the conversation, he makes that statement. He says, the thief, as in the religious leaders, came to steal, kill and destroy. See that joy, the freedom, the excitement this man had in being healed? Religion came to wipe it off his face, came to squash it down, came to take away the enthusiasm and so on. That's what, that's what religion does. That's what the thief does. I came that you'd have life just like this man has. The joy, the excitement of being healed, seeing for the first time the life that he felt. That's what I've got for you. And that's what he has for every single person in this room. But there's a way that we get to that. And that life is the fruit of following. The life that Jesus has for us is the fruit of actually following him following him not just knowing stuff but daily interacting in our relationship with him daily bringing him into those different areas of our world you know you know what's interesting i believe this the life that jesus talked about right go back to john 10 the life that he talked about was an experiential life this man had had an experience an encounter with god (laughs) i believe that god wants us to actually experience him I don't believe that Jesus just, just, just wanted us to read pages of a book and just hope. I believe that he wants us to experience his reality. He wants us to have encounters with him. Now, here's the thing. I believe that everybody has experiences and encounters with God, everybody, Christian or non-Christian, because God loves everybody. When Jesus saw Zacchaeus in a tree, Zacchaeus was not a Christian. Jesus said, come on down. Zacchaeus didn't really recognize or understand what was going on. But as a result of that, of course, Zacchaeus gets his heart right with the Lord. I'm going to sell everything and give it away. Here's the thing. If you're following God, you recognize the experiences and the encounters. When you're not following him, you don't recognize them. You just call them chance, luck, happenstance. Think about it. Jesus fed 5,000 people with two loaves and fish. You can read the story yourself. Jesus fed 5,000 people. Then he gets in a boat the next day, goes across the other side of the lake. The crowds that that he fed jump in a boat the next morning, go across, they find Jesus and they go, oh, how'd you get here? And then Jesus says to them, what do you want? And they say this, they say, we we, 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 we want to see a sign. Jesus says this, he says, I am the son of God. And they said, okay, we'll we'll believe you, but what sign are you going to show us so that we can believe? Think about that. How stupid would that have been? You've just seen 5,000 people fed with two fish and a piece of bread. Now, surely that would be enough for you to then go, you must be the son of God. But instead, they said, no, what sign? You You know why? Because when you're not following God, you don't recognize the signs. When you're not following God, you don't acknowledge God in the midst of those moments. When you're following God, you begin to recognize the things that God is doing. You begin to notice the things that God is doing. Uh, The Pharisees, Jesus can heal this blind man. And instead of getting excited about something God had done, instead of recognizing we're standing in the middle of a miracle, watching something, an encounter that, that God brought, not only did that man get healed, but those Pharisees were encountering God through that man who was blind and now he could see. They're looking at a miracle. God's not just doing it for the blind man. He's doing it for them. But because they're not following him, they've decided not to follow him, they don't even recognize it. They get angry because it was on the wrong day of the week. I mean, it's amazing when you read some of the miracles in the Bible and you think, how how stupid must these people have been to not pick up that there was something pretty cool about Jesus? (laughs) He backed up his his words with his actions. There was something happening around this man's life. But here's the thing. When you're not following him, you don't recognize those moments and those encounters with God when you start following him when you get to that place where you're genuinely following him you start noticing God's activity in your world you start seeing things. you know when I was I was uh, about 18 years of age I went to uh, South Ballina Beach with a bunch of friends of mine and we were I was not a believer and we went we used to go to South Ballina and we would take all the things that we shouldn't be taking because uh, South Ballina was hard to get to back then and we'd go to the beach pitch a tent and do all the things that we knew we shouldn't be doing because no adult was going to go to South Ballina and, and no one cared you know so we went down there I remember one night and we're doing our stupid stuff and all of a sudden these two guys walked past us and they just sat down with us and they began to tell us how oh I've just got out of um, prison for this and prison for that and they're talking themselves up Anyway, one of the guys I was with is a bit of a smart aleck, so he made a few smart aleck comments. And uh, anyway, these two guys got up and walked away. Three hours later, they came back with bats, knives, a machete. Guy had a knife with a blade about that big, and they beat us. They just started beating us. 
And I remember after the beating, they told us all to get up. So we all stood up and they lined us up in a line and I was at the front of the line. A guy walked up to me with a knife and he stuck it under my throat. And I honestly thought, this is the end of my life. I'm finished here. In that moment, I said something that just came out from the inside of me. I said, oh God, God help. The minute I said that, it was almost like this guy was in a trance and his mate was in a trance. The minute I said, oh God help, the other guy literally, his body shook like, what are we doing? He came running over, grabbed his mate with the knife, dragged the knife away from me and started shaking his mate, going, what are we doing? We can't be doing this. Anyway, we, we ended up going back to our tents and middle of the night, we walked all the way back up the road to, to go home. We weren't going to hang around any longer. But you know what? In that moment, I didn't really recognise that God had just done something wonderful for me because I wasn't following God. I wasn't following God. After I started following God and I started reflecting back at my life, I went, God, you were there. God, you were there. God, some of these ways that you were in my world were so plain, so obvious. But when you're not following him, you don't recognize his activity and what it is that he's doing. See, God God wants us to be as believers in that place where we are walking with him and we're experiencing him. And I'm not, when I say experience, don't think I'm saying every morning you're going to end up with goosebumps and hair standing up and lights shining in your bedroom and all that stuff. I've had moments like that two, three times in my entire life. That's it. But, but God interacts with us in some simple, normal, everyday ways. A word of encouragement from a friend, a phone call from someone, a bill that gets paid to you at the right time. And when you're following God, you recognize these things and you go, that's God. And he gets glory for it. You praise him for his interactions and his... This is the kind of life that I believe believers are meant to have. God wants us to be aware of his activity. And, and, and recognising the encounters and recognising those moments, it'll only come for you when you start following him. Matter of fact, if you're sitting here and you, you're, if you're literally sitting here going, I can't see God anywhere in my world, God does nothing, then I would encourage you to go back to the word of God and go back and sit before the Lord with your own heart. Are you really following him? Because your father loves you. He's not abandoning you. He's not just going to sit there and go, whatever will be, will be. I'll see you in heaven and it'll all be good then. God, God wants to get involved in our world down here. That's what discipleship is. It's allowing God to get involved in our world down here, not waiting till we get to heaven, not thinking that we've got to die before we actually get a chance to live. Jesus actually said, this is eternal life, that, that, that they may know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. In other words, you're living in eternal life right now. And eternal life is different to temporal life. Amen? It's a different kind of a life. One of the marks of a true follower is that they have become fully engaged in the experience of Christianity. Fully engaged in the experience um, I was at netball yesterday with Chloe. She was doing netball. You, you want to come on up? We're going to finish with a song. I, I was at netball the other day, uh, yesterday, and I was talking to another parent there. And this parent, I asked this lady, oh, how's your husband going? <coughs> Great God-fearing couple, wonderful couple. And, and she said this to me. She said, um, well, actually, um, don't talk to my husband. Or if you do, don't mention Parramatta. And then she begins to tell me this story and she was almost embarrassed. She's like, he just becomes another person. So when the eels are on him, and you wouldn't believe this, he's so nice and pleasant. Eels are on, she said, we don't even, we know not even, you know, we used to say to him at the end of it, hey dad, it's just a game. So we don't say that anymore. She said, you don't ever say it was just a game. I said, yeah, I, I get it. But I want you to go and tell him one thing, stop whinging. I'm a Tiger supporter. So she did. But you know what, it made me think after that conversation, though, I thought, I get what you're saying. Because we've all got somebody in our world who in that environment engages and experiences and really dives into the experience of, I don't know, if you're watching a footy game or something, the Roosters are playing. We've all got those people in our world who uh, become something other than. You come and watch, you, you, it's passion. It's what it is, it's passion. But the thing is this, they, they dive into, they dive into the experience. They dive into the experience. I feel like there are so many believers in the world, particularly the Western world, and I can only speak about that because that's where I am. It's almost like we want the benefits of heaven. We want the fire insurance slip from God. And we think 
that our message is to walk up to a world and go, hey, guess what? I've got a fire insurance slip. Would you want one? We are so underselling the reality and the power of God. The gospel is about transformation. God transforms us. He changes us. And we're changed out of relationship with Him. We're not changed because we memorized 100 verses. We're not changed because we came to church four times on the weekend. We're not changed because we listened to podcasts. We're we're changed because we actually, in the midst of doing those things, we open ourselves up and we engage with the Holy Spirit. We engage with God. That's what discipleship is. I wonder how many of us sitting here, I wonder if there's anybody here that relates and you're sitting there going, but God does nothing for me. I never see Him. I never hear Him. I never... Can I, can I encourage you firstly by saying that's a lie? That's not true. Maybe you need to go back and look at, uh, are you really following? Are you really following Him? Uh, have, you, have you dove into this experience called the Christian life? Have you surrendered it to God? Have you, have you, have you, have you, have you engaged with God in that way? Or are you just looking for a, a nice set of moral values that give your life some kind of safe framework? One thing I know about, about this thing called discipleship, there's, not, there's nothing safe about it. It's a radical lifestyle of obedience and dependence on God. And it changes you. It kills you for ordinary. It, it, it makes you realize that, you know what, when you thought you were in control, you were running on two cylinders in a V8. You need the other four. No, you need the other four, and then eventually, they're smart, Alec. Were you a maths teacher when you used to teach? Running on six. <laughs> but here's the thing. Here's, here's what I want to want to leave you with. The end goal always in every interaction Jesus had. The end goal was this: I'm I'm doing and I'm speaking and so on because the end goal is I love you. I want you to follow me. I want you to follow me. I want you to come. I'm, I'm, I want to take you somewhere. I want to make you someone. I just want you to follow me. I don't care whether you think you're not good enough. Just follow me. I don't care whether you think you've done stuff that is so out there that, that you could never reflect my glory to. No, I, I don't care about that. I just want you to follow me. I don't care whether you think you're too stupid and you don't know enough of the Bible. I don't care. Just follow me. I don't care if nobody like, I, 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 I don't care if you're quirky and, and, and you're a bit weird and the church world doesn't really embrace you and understand you. I, look, I just want you to follow me. I just want you to follow me. I just want you to follow me. <laughs> but not only does he ask us to follow him, but the most beautiful part about it is this. He empowers us to follow him. You don't have to do it on your own, in your own strength. John 14, verse 16, 17. Jesus said this. He said, and I will pray the Father. And he will give you another helper. That word another literally means one of the exact same kind. One of the exact same kind. The Holy Spirit is not something different to Jesus. It's one of the exact same kind. I will give you another helper that I may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and he will be in you. So Jesus calls you to follow him, but he empowers you to follow him as well. And I just want to close this morning by just praying over each person here. I want to pray for a reawakening maybe for some of us of of. Sometimes when you do something for a long time, you forget why you got in the first place. Church can be no different. Your walk with God can be no different. If you don't keep your antenna up and you don't keep that relationship with God active, you can just wake up one day and go, I don't even know why I do the things I do. I don't even know why I read the Bible. I don't even know why I pray. I don't know why I go to that silly meeting on a Sunday morning. Why do I do that? I don't think God wants us to think that way. 
I want to pray for a, a reawakening of an awareness of the sense of the Holy Spirit in our life. That, that God's given us something. Not only called us to follow, but He's empowered you to follow Him. He's given you everything that you need to be able to follow Him this morning. Amen. Is that true? Now, if that's you, I'm going to ask you to do one thing. If you feel like maybe you need that little bit of a spark, maybe, maybe your Christian walk has gotten a little bit, I don't know, maybe you feel like you've got reasons why you feel like you can't follow Him. I, I, I want to challenge every one of those reasons because you've got what you need to follow Him. If that's you this morning, I just felt like the Lord said just to pray for a fresh refilling, a fresh sense of the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. So if that's you, I'm just going to ask you just to, as an act of faith, just stand up. No one's going to judge you for it. No one's going to look sideways at you. It's irrelevant. But if you're here this morning and you feel like, you know what, there's, uh, there, there's something going on in my walk with God. I'm dissatisfied. I need that next thing. I, I want to get back. Maybe I want to get back on track with where I once was with my, my, my walk with God because I'm not going to grow because I want to. I've got to work with God. I've got to cooperate with God. And He's empowered me to do what needs to be done. If there's anybody here, if that's you, I just want to ask you real quick, just just stand up for me. I want to pray for you. I want to pray just for a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit upon your life this morning. There's more. Yep, that's great. That's great. I I, I feel like there's more people. Don't be embarrassed. This is the thing. If, If we're embarrassed to stand up for Jesus here, if God's really doing something in your heart, you've got no hope doing it out there in the world. No hope whatsoever. We get so self-conscious sometimes when we come to church. The Holy Spirit speaks to us and all He's saying is just an act of faith, just something, just, just, just be a little bit vulnerable with me. Let the wall come down and trust me. There's a reason why the Bible says to believers, don't gossip. Because we should be the most open and real about where we are. We should have the most... Uh, trusting relationships that I can hear the worst possible thing coming out of your mouth and you should know that I'm like a steel trap. I'm not taking that anywhere because it's nobody's business. That's the church God wants. Take the mask off. It's not a masquerade party. Leave the mask at the door and just be who you are. If you're a Klingon, you're a Klingon. If your passion's down, your passion's down. If you're firing on eight cylinders, good on you. If you're firing on two and you don't know that four and two don't equal eight, well, so be it. So the rest of you, I want you to do this. If you're not standing, I want you to turn. I want you to reach your hand out to someone. We're going to pray for them this morning. We're going to pray for the Holy Spirit to do something in their life. And thank you, by the way, for your humility and your honesty. Here's what the Bible says. God, God resists the proud, but it says He gives grace to the humble. He gives grace to the humble. So, Father, we want to pray for these people here right now, Lord. God, I pray right now, Father, that just in obedience to what I believe you said, I'm praying right now for a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit upon each of these people's lives, Lord, a fresh touch from heaven. God, would you stir up uh, and stoke that flame, that passion for you, God, not a passion for religion, not a passion for works, but a passion for the, the power and the presence of God in their life. And Father, we, 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 we stand with them, God. Any works of the enemy right now in Jesus' name, we stand against those works together, God. We push back the forces of darkness upon their life in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And Father, we pray that they would experience, have a fresh experience of your presence in their life, God, a fresh encounter. Father, open their eyes to see what you're doing in their world. Open their ears to hear the voice of God to them. And Father, we ask this in the wonderful name of Jesus. And together, everyone said, Amen, Amen. Let's stand. We're going to finish with a song and then we can disappear from here.